Thanks. I appreciate it. You're nervous or you're stressed. Welcome to another edition of the uh, Roundtable. My name is Paul Dingham. I'm glad to have you along. As you know, this uh, show, we get a chance to spend a few more minutes with, uh, with our guests and uh, find out what they're doing and what they've been doing. And this fellow that is sitting next to me is our state senator, Phil Pablo, from the 25th District of Michigan. And we've been doing these programs for uh, quite a few years, maybe 15 years or so. Yeah, and it's always great more. to come back and check in with you. And uh, you were our speaker today at the St. Clair Rotary. Yes. And when I introduced you, I said that uh, you'd been uh, the St. Clair County representative for uh, the, the county board yes. when we first met. And then you went on to state rep and now uh, finishing the second term as our state senator. Right. So. We've had quite an opportunity to look at Lansing and look at uh, politics, and yeah. and we thought we'd get your impressions of where we're at in that world and what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, well, it's been an honor to serve. It really has. And looking back over the last 15 years, I've met wonderful people, worked on very important issues, and learned a lot about how uh, local government yeah. works with state government, what that um, national intersection is. But more importantly, what's important to people in the thumb? And you hear about it every day, wherever you go. Uh, there's challenges that families face, and we're there to try to even out some of those challenges. So it's been a truly an honor to serve every single day. I've appreciated it. The, you started in, uh, as a state representative, and you represented uh, really basically uh, St. Clair and East and St. Clair Township and, and portions of Port Huron. Right. And that was good for a while. Then it changed, didn't it? The, 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 yeah. The, the, um, in, a state representative represents around 90,000 people, plus or minus a few. And then um, every 10 years, because of redistricting and the constitutional requirements of voter, voting rights, we change. And so when I moved to the state Senate, it was about 275,000 wow. people. And that was St. Clair and Lapeer County, so two full counties. Well, in 2011, that map changed again, and then I picked up a little bit of Macomb, all of mm. St. Clair, all of Sand Lake, and all of Huron. So my district goes from New Baltimore to Port Austin, and I would argue it's the most beautiful district that there is in the state of Michigan. It's the sunrise side of the state, as they say. Yeah, I'm sure like Alpena uses that line, but yeah. but it is a beautiful side of the state, and people. And it's uh, so diverse. Right. I mean, the, the people from Macomb County, the industrial side of that district, and the heavy population clear up to you know the heavy ag and tourism uh, balanced economy there, and uh, a lot of a lot of diverse issues between here and there, and a lot of great people. One of the things that uh, you talked about is infrastructure. That how that might have some influence influence on the state and, and probably this area too. Yeah, well, we'll grow as a state when we start investing significantly in infrastructure. And if you've been paying any attention to the national debate on infrastructure, President Trump is talking about a trillion dollar investment over 10 years. Trump. It's massive. Yeah, there was a, a big press conference where he made lots of noise about uh, other issues, mm -hmm. but. But wasn't that, was that press conference uh, about the infrastructure and is that gone into effect? Or it is hasn't he just gone proposing? into effect and it's going to be a proposal. Proposal. But it's okay. going to be a unique mix of um, different ideas and new ways of delivering big infrastructure okay. projects. It'll okay. have a public and private component to it, which, you know, government doesn't have the money actually to, sometimes we can hardly keep up with the infrastructure that we have, but in terms of developing a long range strategic plan, um, the president is proposing bringing private dollars in to offset and accelerate, in fact, some of these projects. And it, it, um, it gives us another avenue for revenue, and it will speed up some of the projects. It will have a big impact on Michigan. So that whole proposal still has to go before Congress? Yes. Okay. So that will be further down the fall I think agenda. after we get done with the health care debate, which looks like it will be going on week. for a while. Yeah. Um, and then we'll be discussing at the federal level the uh, tax reforms and some tax cuts at the federal level and infrastructure. And all three of them will go together well because they're all dependent on each other okay. uh, from a tax and from an appropriations process. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, uh, the redistricting uh, when, you, when you said that goes on every 10 years or so. Yeah. Uh, 
when is that, is it in the process now? Is that going to happen It again? will be in full effect in the year 2020, 2020. And then it takes about a year to collect all of the population data. And then once that data is collected, we see where people moved in Michigan. And one of the reasons why um, I picked up part of Macomb County is there was a mass exodus out of Detroit. And so that oh. population trend kind of started dipping down. And you have to, there's a very strict constitutional process in which you draw these districts. And the term gerrymander comes up from time to time. But the truth is, everybody needs the same amount of voters. And the idea is to make as contiguous as possible. So for me to have three full counties and a portion of a fourth really shows that it's, it's done with um, some science behind it. And you got to do it for the whole state. And our congressional district is also redrawn. So that'll happen. The people that are running in 2022, which seems like a long way away, but it's really not, they will have a potentially different looking map to some extent. It's not as easy as drawing lines for townships. Where no, they're, they're it square, isn't. They're rectangles. Six and square miles. And yeah, that's how that's, the, that, that's pretty easy, pretty yeah, simple. And you never have to change that. And you never have to change it. Uh, you look at some of those districts down to Detroit. I mean, they're long and square. Yeah, you know, they're, they're odd little shapes and et cetera, et cetera. So there's yeah. a lot of controversy over that. There is always controversy over because, quite frankly, the party that's in ruling power right. has the final determination. But it goes beyond the legislature. It also has to go to the Supreme Court okay. to make sure the Voting Rights Act was taken care of, the APOL standards were taken care of, um, majority minority districts. Um, are also need to be recognized under the Federal Voter Rights Act. So there's a lot to it. Um, it gets politicized. Yep. There'll be a issue potentially on the ballot in 2018 oh, that okay. will change over um, a new process of redistricting. Oh God, really? But you know what I say is that every voter who casts his or her vote in a general election has actually casted a vote for. Um, the majority and for the voters rights and redistricting because your vote puts in place your state legislatures your congressional delegations and your state senators. so you actually do have a play in it and right now michigan is one of the 23 states that has the trifecta which is a republican control of house senate and the governorship so you know it's it's a political battle always right. and at first and always but in the end i think we get it right okay um as we said at the start of the show, you've been around uh, the uh, government and legislatures for about 15 years plus. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that time you've spent on, a majority of that time you spent on education. Yeah. Uh, Lynn Griff Griffor uh, from uh, the East China School Board was in attendance at the meeting today. And she asked you what changes you thought you'd seen in those 15 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I answered her question this way. What, the way that we're going to improve education is put more control into the classroom. It's very difficult to um, develop great education policy in Washington, D.C. You know, in Michigan, every one of our schools has different challenges. They have a different demographic. And so if we can't come up with a system that empowers the local districts to be able to make those critical decisions when it comes time for mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. and for school management, then we're going to really miss the boat. And so we've always been working to push more of that power. You know, we control it in Lansing to a certain extent. We have a state board of education that also has input. We just have too many, you know, cooks in the kitchen when it comes to education. Our teachers know how to teach. We need to let them. What did you say? I think there how many school districts are there in the 552 state? school districts. And all 552 have independently elected school boards. So that's, you know, times seven. That's how many people are... Uh, typically on a school board and then you know you have the state's role in it Michigan's role in it and then the federal government's role in it and what you have is you've created one of the most highly regulated industries that there are in the country in public education and what regulations mean is that there is somebody employed in that school district who ought to be teaching and ought to be focusing on instruction that is otherwise filling out federal forms and compliance and all of the mandated reporting things that are are required from our teaching professionals we've gotten away from the actual instruction and who best to instruct the people closest to the kids in the classroom um, you are term limited and yes. your position uh, will be uh, re replaced by somebody else in yes. the next election yes. that'll be in November in November 2018 2018, 2018. Yes. but uh, let's talk a couple things uh, what do you think about term limiting and what's the future of uh, the state well, I think term limiting 
has proven to be uh, very challenging. And by that I say, I've been fortunate enough to serve 14 years in the legislature, not everybody has that. But coming into the state house, um, very new, I was new at that mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. in 2005, didn't have a lot of government experience. And by the time you get up and understand the complexity of the budgeting process and the policy, you realize that there's more power outside of the elected branches of government than there are on the inside. Lobbyists. Lobbyists and the bureaucrats that, you know, I don't use bureaucrats as a negative term, but that's what they're referred to, and they're in all of the departments, Department of Education, Department of Transportation, Natural Resources, Environmental Quality, Corrections, and that's a massive infrastructure. And they're career people. They're career people, and they will outlast. They're trying to do the right thing. Yeah, they will outlast any new representative that comes in deciding to reform or make significant changes to any one of the departments. So it's, it's a wheel that turns in the same direction all the time. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to, like in my last year as a state senator, I've been able to see what works, what doesn't work, where we've made mistakes, what has been things that have driven improvement and outcomes. And you only get that by time on the job. We have a lot of great talented people in the state house and the state senate. But the system is sort of designed to wear that down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think in, in years coming, there might be some changes to term limits. And I think one of the changes that I think the people would support is 14 years in either chamber. So oh. in Michigan, if you do six years, no matter what, you're out the door. I was fortunate to be able to move to the Senate and continue my work. Uh, why couldn't we have a system where our state representatives could be there for 14 years? Imagine the kind of government that you could get and the kind of decision making just based on the experience part. And every year, every two years in the House, you would be up for a new job interview. And, and it'd be up to the voters. Yeah, and you did that last year. You wanted to run for, yeah. uh, for Congress. And uh, as I alluded to uh, this afternoon at the Rotary meeting, uh, you walked in more parades than uh, we any covered man humanly possible. Yeah, we covered a lot of ground, met a lot of great people, and I took away from that just a wonderful experience mm -hmm. and, and a knowledge of expanding outside of my initial Senate district, but to be able to start to understand and work on policies at the federal level. So a lot of foreign relations stuff we had to get prepared on yeah. and a lot of trade issues and you know it really brought into focus how important I know that I represent an agriculture district but how important the driving industry is when it comes time for exporting those goods to Korea or the Pacific Rim and what that interaction interplay was. It was a great learning experience and I don't regret it a bit. Uh, what's the future hold for Phil Pablo? Well, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Right now, I'm just focused on what the next year has to hold for us. I mean, we still have a lot of priorities that need to be taken care of that when I walk out the door, I'd like to say we gave it our best shot. I think in the next year, we're going to work really hard on auto insurance reform, no fault. Mm -hmm. You know, it's crushing families. Our families are paying the most amount of money for uh, automobile insurance as anyone in the country. And if we can get our hands around that and provide some relief, that's almost better than a, a long-term tax cut. It's instant to families who are mm -hmm. struggling making that premium. On top of you know rising premiums for their health care and other things in their world, we ought to be able to focus in on auto no-fault. The auto no-fault, what was the problem there? You, there's two sides Well, to the, it. the biggest issue is that we have unlimited lifetime benefits okay. for catastrophically injured people. I 100% agree and support the fact that if you're one of those folks in your family or you personally have been catastrophically injured, you ought to deserve the care that you get. But 99% of auto insurance rate payers do not reach the catastrophic level. So where does the money go? That's where does the money go? So we want to audit and do a financial audit of what the catastrophic claims fund has in it. Right now it's talking about being 20, a $20 billion account. Is Who it has enough? that fund? It's within the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association, so it's so all it's state not government held. Money. It's one off from government. Okay. And so that's we want to be able to get some transparency there. And we think that uh, motorists should be able to choose their level of coverage okay. that they want. We're going to require a threshold that, you know, I think the Senate talked about a $5 million minimum. Um, and then if you wanted to go to 10, you could take, pay 10. If you wanted to pay for 20 million, you could pay 20. That way, we're not all in the basket of unlimited liability <laughs> when 99% of the accidents don't reach that threshold. Um, 
Well, it, what else have we, we got to talk about? You, well, you, next you, year, yeah. you know, we're going to have an election gonna rolling out. We're going to get a new governor, secretary of state, attorney general. So the process will be starting all over again, probably after the first of the year. Um, you know, we'll be in that mode, not myself, but people and, and, and your listeners and your viewers need to, you know, kind of pay attention and get involved in the process. That's the only way you get the government that uh, that you think. But works don't worry best. about gerrymandering and all that. Just get no. Out and it's vote. the same people in the same districts. Nothing's going to change in 2018. But get involved, and, and the ways to get involved are so much easier now. Um, you know, the social media. Follow any candidate you want. They'll follow you. And we've been able to decentralize campaigns in this country to be able to go directly to That's the people right. that are going to be there making decisions and candidates will want your support and input just give it to them and, and participate because that's the only way that you can truly you know hold them accountable um it's uh, it's a tough rough business up there in lansing but uh you seem to have, have survived very well with it well it's tough i mean you just you can't take it personally you're sent there to do a job people put the confidence in you to go do it and you have to be cognizant of that support that you have but there comes a time when you know your principles have to lead, and sometimes it's not easy work. Uh, you know, and we understand that we create well, detractors along the way, but it's it's built into the process. And you guys work a heck of a lot more than people understand. There are people. Yeah, that's, I mean, a, it's, it's not a three-day not, a week job. No, no. I you mean, know? you're you're going back and forth between uh, here and, and your constituents here, and you've got yes. such a big. Uh, district now that uh... and I would say because of term limits I've had the honor to serve with probably 400 legislators really and I can tell you that almost every single one regardless of their ideology party affiliation take the job very seriously and they're there at the rotary dinners and they're there with the, you know with the parades and the football games and you know the Chamber of Commerce meetings and they're not there because they want the adulation they're there because that's how you find out the makeup of your community. That's where you mm -hmm. get good ideas. Mm -hmm. We could spend two more shows on things that I've been able to get done in the legislature that I didn't know were a problem. But someone at a dinner came up and said, well, we're having this challenge with our health insurance. Um, they are the, the state reps and senators are your closest contact to state government. And we all hold office hours. And what's amazing is, unless there's a real hot button issue, you know, you only get between five and 10, maybe 15 people will come to your office hours. What well, we do those, not just because we don't have anything <coughs> else to do. We want to hear what's happening so that when we go back to Lansing, we can and make feedback. good decisions. Phil Pablo, state senator from uh, the 25th district. It's about an honor to have you here. We'll have you back again. Of course, no, it's my before, pleasure. Before the, uh, before the season is over for you. Good for enough. You, until I'll you take move you on to your it. next thing. That's about it for this edition of uh, the Roundtable. Thanks very much for tuning in. Till next time, I'm Paul Dingaman. See you soon.